In March 2017, I took a journey I had wanted to take for many years, exploring the Odenwald Mountains and Forests of Southwest Germany. The reason for this being is that I have heard and read about the many strange experiences hikers and campers have had in the region, ranging from electromagnetic anomalies to strange spectral lights which move through the woods at night and which have no known explanation. Local legend has associated these lights with ghosts, while others maintain their balls of plasma. In recent decades, they have been compared to UFOs and even the result of Nazi occult science experiments performed during the Second World War. Pretty much everything I was looking for in terms of my own interest and research was contained within the mountains, forests, and Fortean phenomena of the Odenbaum. The forest of the Odenwald is considered less touristy than the more well-known and popular Black Forest and for this reason is less frequented by family day trippers and appeals to the more off-the-beaten-path explorer. The trees of the Odenwald forest are so dense that in some parts, even during daylight, it can be as dark as late evening on the forest floor. Interesting rock formations and ruined ancient castles are everywhere. All of this has led to the Odenwald attaining the reputation of one of the most mysterious and wild places in Germany and after the Harz Mountains is considered the most sacred location for Germanic paganism and witchcraft to this day. The region is saturated in folklore and mythology and the name itself Odenwald literally translates as Odin's Wood. Germanic folklore maintains that Odenwald is the real birthplace of the Nordic gods Odin and Thor. It is a land of dragons, wild women and witches. The Odenwald's role played in the history of alchemy as well as hexan and other forms of magic cannot be understated. Frankenstein's castle, which is said to have inspired Mary Shelley's classic gothic novel, is located here and is considered one of the most haunted places in Europe. What surprised me more than anything else was that the Germans today who live around the Odenwald are still very wary of the region and will only hike and walk along the more popular hiking trails. When I finished my own hike and told locals in the village of Munthal where I had spent the previous two days in the forest, they were extremely surprised. I was warned that the mountains and the deep forest is home to colts and coffins, although I did not see any of this myself as I'd made sure to do the journey respectfully outside of the pagan feast days such as Valpurgis. Another concern is that wolves have been streaming into Germany from Poland since the 1990s and hunters have reported that some animals appear to have been subject of wolf attacks in the Odenwald, although no official sightings have yet been reported. In fact, the possibility of wolves in the region only made the hike more appealing as it is my contention that the wolf is the power animal spirit of Europe and from a magical unconsciousness aspect the return of wolves into a region where they had been hunted to extinction in the past only adds to the magical vitality of the location. Although there are no known megalithic sites or structures in the Odenwald, I was not deterred as I wanted to investigate the strange rock formations of the region as well as their unique magnetic anomalies as part of my own research into the possible energetic forces contained within rocks used in the construction of megalithic sites around Europe. The Odenwald spans a region between the Upper Rhine Plain and the River Main, spanning parts of three German states, Hesse, Baden and the Lower Franconia part of Bavaria. The geology of the region is truly ancient, at least 200 million years old when the Germanic Basin formed. 50 million years ago, the region was highly volcanically active and many of the peaks in the Odenwald are extinct volcanoes from this period. It was around this time when the Rhine Rift began to form as a fracture zone from the Mediterranean Sea to Norway. The geological intensity of the region only adds to the sense of underlying mystery and strangeness.
During the all-important date of 2500 BC, the first evidence of human settlement in the form of pottery showed up in the Odin Val. Celtic tribes moved into the region about 400 BC in the same virgin forest that remained from the previous Ice Age and which is the same forest of the region today, giving testament to the truly ancient unbroken natural landscape of the Odin Val as we experience it in the 21st century. The visitor once off the main road and hiking trails experiences the Odin Val pretty much as how the Romans found the region in 100 AD. The Romans never really fully conquered the Odin Val properly and by 260 AD they had been beaten back by the Germanic tribes. This was followed by the rise of the Franks in the 5th century under the powerful ruler Clovis I. Christianity arrived by means of Irish, Scottish and Anglo-Saxon monks and various monasteries began to spring up. However, the resistance to Christians was powerful. Some would argue Christianity never achieved full control in the region. From the Middle Ages to the present, the Odin Val has maintained its status as a wilderness and something of a foreboding as well as romantic location within the German consciousness. Leading up to and during the Second World War, the occult revival of the emerging Third Reich placed the Nordic and wild nature of the Odin Val as a pivotal location of the landscape of the true Germanic soul. And von der Vogel groups began to revive pagan and Nordic traditions among the landscape. The Odin Val was untouched by World War II and has remained a place of mystery and wild ancient beauty ever since. Almost every significant natural and ancient man-made feature of the Odin Val is associated with mythology and legends. Ghosts are particularly strong in the forest, and even to this day many people will not venture into the forest after dark. Most of the castles of the region have numerous ghost stories connected to them, and as we will see, during the Middle Ages and well into the later times, alchemy was a major pursuit within these burgs atop the mountains such as the spectacular Burg Frankenstein near the city of Darmstadt. Tales of knights and witches fill the folklore of the region, as does numerous tales of the devil following travellers on old forested paths at night. Many of the unusual rock outcroppings are referred to as devil's altars, and devil's chairs and so on. This may have been due to the strange sensations the visitor and even myself experienced at these specific rock outcroppings. Witches in the shape of giant menacing pigs are also a common folktale of the woods. The most famous of all the Odenwald's folktales is that of the Nybel Ungenled, as the tale of the murder of Siegfried, the dragon slayer, by the Hagen of Troje, and to this day the location of Siegfried's murder is still a subject of contention and endless speculation. Many tales of witches and curses abound in a location filled with nature spirits and demons. The Brothers Grimm were heavily inspired by the folklore of the Odin Val and collected an enormous canon of tales and mythology from every part of the region. One famous tale speaks of a spectral knight named Rodenstein who rides through the forest after dark in the company of his warriors. One of the most interesting tales of the Odin Val is that of the wild woman with a unicorn and some of the aforementioned devil's rocks are also known as the wild woman rocks. The wild woman are Wilden Bikin wild women who live in the forest have the powers to beguile male visitors and shapeshift between various animals and humans and even move between dimensions and time. The building bicken or wild woman's association with the unicorn has particularly strong sexual and feminine feral qualities. The unicorn represents an ancient Indo-European archetype which entered into European folklore by ancient Greek mythology. 
The unicorn within Germanic folklore is depicted as a woodland horse or sometimes a goat-like animal, which is always white and cloven hoofs, and also sometimes has a goat's beard. From the folklore of the early Middle Ages, the unicorn represents the chastity of the virgin, and it is believed that only a virgin can capture a wild unicorn. Clearly, the relationship between the unicorn's horn and a phallus is particularly significant here, and this may represent the necessity of aristocratic or women of royal or noble blood refraining from contamination with blood outside that of the regal or noble bloodline. This is also why the image of the unicorn appears greatly on heraldry and aristocratic and royal regalia. In the case of the building, clearly the representation is of sexual promiscuity and straying from purity of blood. The Wildenbicken may represent the archetype of women who have chosen sexual partners of their own rather than having them selected for them in arranged marriages to act as a warning to respectable ladies of the nobility not to indulge in sexual relationships with commoners or else they will be reduced to the level of the Wildenbicken. This is not to say that these wild women of the Germanic forest, such as the Odenwald, did not actually exist. It is almost certain that they did in the form of crones and witches who lived alone in the forest. And this archetypal story of the consequences of sexual liberation may have been created as a warning for an overstory in order to create more fear and as a result, greater persecution upon these hermit women who live within the Odenbal. Within the Hesse part of Germany, there are many historic castles located along a region known as the Hessian Bergstrasse. Perhaps the most famous of them all is Castle Frankenstein, or Burg Frankenstein, which sits at an elevation of 370 meters on a mountain near the city of Darmstadt. The name Frankenstein, Frankenstein, is a German name consisting of two words, literally meaning the Rock of the Franks or the stone of the tribe of the Franks who inhabited the region. In the 12th century, a Lord Conrad II built the original castle Frankenstein and then named himself as von Frankenstein. The earliest documentation proving the existence of the castle is from 1252 and bears his name. Castle Frankenstein was in the Imperial Barony of Frankenstein and which was subject under the jurisdiction of the Holy Roman Empire as well as the possessions of Darmstadt and the Duchy of Hesse. The castle that we see today dates from the 11th century but it's almost certainly built upon the ruins of a castle that existed before that close by to the location where the famous Castle Frankenstein sits today. In 1292, the Frankensteins opened up the castle to the Counts of Katzen Elbogen noble family and formed a military and commercial alliance. In 1363, the castle was split into two parts and remarkably was controlled by two different families of knights and lords. And this situation remained until the 15th century when the castle was then amalgamated into a single control and was enlarged. At this point, the knights became independent of any baronial control and operated under the jurisdiction of their own barony. This is one of the legions of Germany which stood up to the Protestant Reformation and the various territorial and religious conflicts that broke out at the time remaining loyal to the Holy Catholic Faith and the Holy See. And it was during this period that the controller of the Frankenstein Castle, Lord John I, took it upon himself to sell the lordship to the landgraves of Hesch Darmstadt in 1662 after a series of lawsuits and imperial infighting. 
From that point on, the castle was used as both a hospital and a refuge during times of conflict and eventually fell into ruins during the 1700s with renovations carried out in the mid 19th century, giving the castle its distinct appearance that it has today. The castle itself, apart from playing a pivotal role in the history of Germany and in the Reformation, is also the center of a mysterious landscape and also contains powerful legendary status within itself, both fictional and based in reality. In 1673, a Johann Conrad Dippel was born in the castle and upon reaching adulthood began a career as an alchemist. According to legend, it is believed that Dippel is the inspiration for Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein. Although there is no mention in her journals at the time, it is known, however, that in 1814, just before she began writing the Frankenstein novel, she took a journey up the River Rhine and spent several hours in the town of Geschheim, which is located close to the castle. Many authors and researchers have attributed Johann Conrad Dippel's influence as the primary creation of the Baron Frankenstein of her famous novel. Another interesting aspect is that the creation of this novel took place in what was known as the year without a summer, when environmental effects caused by a volcano covered Europe in a cloud of darkness that lasted during the whole summer period and which subsequently gave birth to the Gothic novel and art movements. Johann Conrad Dippel became famous for a product he created as an alchemist from animal oil known as Dippel's oil, which at the time was believed to be an elixir of life. Dippel also used the formula for his Dippel's oil in order to try and purchase Castle Frankenstein, although this was refused. During his stay at the Castle Frankenstein, Dippel practiced not only alchemy, but also there are many rumors that he performed experiments upon dead bodies which he exhumed. According to local legend, Dippel dug up dead bodies and performed ghastly and sacrilegious medical experiments upon them in the castle's tower. And when this became known publicly, a local cleric warned within his parish that Dippel had created a monster and brought him to life by means of a bolt of lightning which had struck the tower. Amazingly, in 2017, there are still people in the surrounding villages that claim this actually happened, and credence must be given to their stories, as the families that live in this region have a long genealogy and heritage in the location, and family memories are both strong and reliable. And there's also the possibility that this story of Dippel's performing experiments on dead bodies and bringing them to life by means of electricity was related to Shelley's stepmother by none other than the Brothers Grimm. As none of these claims have been conclusively proven to date, some researchers doubt any connection between Mary Shelley and the Frankenstein castle. However, the story of Dippel and his sacrilegious reanimating of dead bodies and body parts predates the Shelley novel, therefore it is highly unlikely that Mary Shelley was unaware of the story of what took place, let alone that she would name the novel directly after this famous location. Dippel's decision to become an alchemist, Cashel Frankenstein, was perhaps inspired by the magical location itself, the numerous legends associated with it, and most important of all, the strange magnetic and other qualities inherent in the mountain on which the castle sits. 
In fact, it could be argued that Dipper was actually living inside a gigantic alchemical vessel, which the castle represented, bringing together all these particular forces into one stone encapsulated vessel. If there was ever a place in Europe to practice alchemy, away from the prying eyes of both the church and also had taken advantage of unique environmental and geological qualities of a region, then Cashel was that place. On the grounds of the castle, there is a small chapel, which is still used for services to this day. Within the chapel are friezes and other stone artworks, which are completely filled with all manner of European and hermetic symbolism and esoteric designs. Considering the antiquity of these stone carvings and other monuments, it's quite interesting to note that there are references and hints at everything from Illuminism to early forms of Freemasonry contained within the imagery at a time it is assumed long before Freemasonry became vogue among aristocratic and other orders in Europe. The castle itself, and in particular the chapel, is known to be haunted by numerous ghosts. In 2008, an American TV show called Ghost Hunters International took a visit to the chapel and claimed to have found significant paranormal activity. Using various technical devices common to ghost hunting and ghost investigation teams, sounds from the chapel and the entrance tower itself were recorded and sounded very much like words, and an ultrasonic recorder picked up signals within the chapel itself. Although this would not be surprising considering the nature of the location, and also as I observed myself, the monuments in the chapel are often built of two types of stone one magnetic and one not, and this would also create a signal or a fluctuation within the field around the chapel itself, which any kind of ultrasonic recorder or delicate instrument would probably pick up on. Most interesting of all, as one of the sounds picked up by the Ghost Hunters International team, was a phrase in Old German, or Plattendeutsch, that means Arbo is here, which was interpreted by the team and the castle historians as referring to Arbogast, who was the name of a knight of the castle, apparently announcing his domain over the chapel and the mountain itself. Another sound bite was also interpreted as come here in Old German. The team left the castle, as I did myself, and in particular the chapel, having no doubt that this is a unique place and absolutely a focal point of paranormal and Fortean activity. Dippo had in fact picked a perfect location in which to practice alchemy, and perhaps more. In the more remote and less traversed parts of the Oden Val, near the 417 meter high Mount Inlbez, magnetic anomalies are very commonly connected to the large boulders which surround the mountain. These enormous stone formations, some of which look very much like megaliths, are actually of natural origin. The compasses and even GPS meters do not work properly. In fact, this seems to be a case all over the Odin Valley. In this particular part, however, these magnetic stones have come to form something of a temple for practitioners of modern witchcraft, and in particular the Germanic tradition of Hexan, particularly on heathen feast days such as Valpurgis night, the summer solstice, and Samhain. This is why I took the opportunity to visit the Odin Val outside these heathen festivals in order to show respect for any witches who may have been planning to perform rituals there during these feast days. The landscape around Mount Ilbes is the second most important location for witchcraft in Germany after Mount Brocken in the Harz region. The dense forest of the Odenval is punctuated by all kinds of geologic anomalies. Large rocks that seem out of place 
as mentioned, have strange magnetic qualities, but also have a strange emotional and psychological quality connected to them. And this leads to association with folklore and mythology. Near Frankenstein's castle is the Falchenmere, which played a pivotal role in the legend of Siegfried the Dragon Slayer on his trip from the city of Worms to the Odenwald, where he was murdered by the Hagen of Troja at the Falchenmere's Siegfried Quell, essentially a waterfall of rocks. The folklore of the Odenval has managed to persist over time, but yet the area still retains this sense of remoteness and disconnection from the modern world. From dragons in the air, to gnomes and dwarfs living just under the ground, to demons which move between the trees, ghostly apparitions, and in particular, the Lindworm where the knight named George fought this giant reptilian beast under the slopes of Frankenstein Castle. Not only a terrifying reptile, which also represents a nature spirit with a great magical power, but also perhaps the most potent symbol of the Odin Val. Prior to my trip to the region, I had been haunted somewhat by dreams involving serpents or reptilian type creatures that had human consciousness were capable of human speech and were possessed of a specific and very frightening viciousness. I knew little or nothing about the lindworm before I went on this trip and began reading about it while I was there. The lindworm is common to Nordic regions as well as Scandinavia and represents generally a serpent but sometimes a large lizard. It stalks visitors through the forest at night and consumes them. When I was returning down from the mountains at the end of my hike, I found myself trapped in darkness. I didn't have enough battery power at my flashlight. My phone didn't work properly. My compass was useless due to the magnetic anomalies. The GPS meter was unable to pick up the location. I wasn't that concerned as I could see the lights of a village reflecting off the clouds in the distance. So I knew the general direction downhill would get me to that location somehow. On the way down, I began to notice a sound behind me as if someone or something was following me. About 25 meters back, if I stopped, there was a shuffle for a second and then it stopped. If I began walking, the sounds started again. Each time I looked back, I saw nothing. Was it a boar? Quite probably. Was it my imagination? Absolutely not, because at some points I did see the bushes rustling and I did get a distinct sensation of a presence in the area. Although the mountains are teeming with wildlife, this was a very specific sense of being followed. But however, it was not a sense of being stopped. In fact, as my journey down the mountain continued, my emotional state went from trepidation to that of almost feeling a sense of company. As if the spirit of the Odenbal was following me back. While it is common and somewhat understandable to associate these places, such as the Odenbal forests, with that of sinister, frightening, or unknown forces of nature being a threat to the traveler on their own, they also bring the heightened senses to a place that has been forgotten within our modern psychology. That relationship between humanity and the wildness, we suddenly become aware that our civilization and our modern world is a rather fleeting experience. And when being thrust back into places such as the Odenwald, be it deliberately or accidentally late at night, as our modern 21st century technology fades, a different technology of the past, that of an awareness of the landscape and what is in it, comes to the fore. You either die of fright or you learn to live with it.